Our next speaker is a business futurist who has been using the internet since 1987, long before many people knew it existed. He's the author of The Future of Leadership and 10 other books. So he's written 11 books. Forbes magazine rated him as the number five social media influencer in the world, the number one in Australia in his area of expertise. For a glimpse into tomorrow's world, please welcome speaker, author, and chocoholic, Gihan Pereira. Thanks, Kurt. Thank you, Kurt, and welcome, everyone. Um, I do want to give you a bit of a glimpse into the future today because, of course, doesn't everyone want to know what's coming up in our future? What would you like to know? How long are you going to live? Who's the next poly that's going to kick, get kicked out of Parliament? Somebody always wants to know about lotto numbers. So what if I told you that I recently came face to face with the future in the most unexpected way when I went on a journey into my past? See, a couple of years ago, I went on a holiday to Sri Lanka with my parents. And now this is a country where I was born, but I hadn't been there for more than 30 years. So as you can imagine, it was quite an amazing experience. Uh, sometimes I felt inspired. Sometimes I felt crowded. Sometimes I even felt tall. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> you know Sri Lanka is more famous for tea than coffee, but really it's just a country of 23 million short blacks. <laughs> so, why am I sharing this with you? Not because I think you want to see my holiday photos. If you do, come up to me afterwards. I've got a whole other slide deck prepared. Um, but I want to tell you about a conversation that I had on the very last day that I was there. I went with my dad to visit one of his old school friends. So it's my dad in the middle of the photo with a camera around his neck and uh, his friend standing next to him here. But on the far left of that photo is his friend's grandson, Rajiv. Um, he's a giant by Sri Lankan standards. He's five foot six, right? <laughs> and he works in IT. Now, it doesn't mean he works in a call center. He set up a software company with three of his mates, and it's done really well now. It's floated on the US Stock Exchange, because what they do is they look at, uh, uh, they analyze these satellite photographs of shopping center car parks. And they look at the traffic coming in and out, and he, ten he can tell a retailer where to build, where to expand, what are the best opening hours, even what products to stock in each season. Um, they've got clients all around the world now. Here in Australia, they work with Target and Woolworths. So there are a lot of people who will tell you how the world has changed, but I reckon when a bloke in boardies and sandals working from his home office in Colombo, Sri Lanka, can tell me what I can buy in my local Woolies in Perth, that's when we know the world has changed, do you agree? And it's changed in three big ways. It's fast, it's flat, and it's free. So let me tell you what that means and what that means for us globally, but also locally and for our businesses. Um, so we start with free. We kind of all experienced that. That things that used to cost a lot now cost a lot less. Uh, you know this if you've uh, downloaded a song on iTunes or Spotify instead of buying the CD, or you download an e-book to your Kindle instead of buying the paperback. I um, always like to look around, just look at the Gen Ys going, what's the CD? What's the paperback? Uh, just true confession time here. Who's ever walked into a shop? I've tried on some clothes or tested some technology, knowing fully well that you're going to go home later and buy it online for half the price? Yeah, right, okay. So every time I ask that question, more people put up their hands. And this is what's happened. Our world's become a lot more competitive because of it. Uh, and a lot of that's due to technology. And that's the second thing that's happened. Our world's got a lot faster because technology has made our world faster. Um, do you know there's more computing power in the first digital watch than in the spaceship that put a man on the moon. So you can just imagine, uh, actually I do need to check something here. Um, who are the Gen Ys in the room, 40 or younger? Okay, I usually see a few aspiring Gen Ys as well, put up their hands there. Uh, I need to tell you what a watch is, <laughs> right? See, so it's this mobile device that we used to have in the 20th century, and it could tell the time and nothing else, which is crazy, isn't it? It's such old technology, um, but it's like this. It's like that, putting a man on the moon. In a few years' time, we'll be able to send people to planets far beyond our solar system. Uh, so can you see a quick show of hands? Who'd like to get in a spaceship and go to another planet? Oh, yeah. yeah, okay. They always get a few. Who can think of somebody else who'd like to put on a spaceship and send to another planet? <laughs> yeah, okay. Right. Don't point to them. <laughs> but it's the same with me. It's like, bye-bye, Kim Kardashian. 
Yeah, okay, okay, that's not very fair, is it? Uh, any of the Kardashians would do, but here's my point, right? <laughs> so, we don't have that technology yet, but that's not the problem. So here's the problem with that whole Kardashians and space scenario. Um, in a few years' time, yeah, so you put up your hand, you'll be able to get in a spaceship with Kim and Chloe and Courtney, head off to another planet far beyond our solar system. But before you get there, long before you get there, you got overtaken by another spaceship that left Earth years after you did, but with better technology. So why would you get on that one? You might as well wait. But this one's got the same problem. Before it gets there, it gets overtaken by another spaceship and so on. The paradox is, it doesn't make sense for any one of them to leave Earth, but until one of them does, nothing happens. And you may go, that's crazy, but I bet you do the same with your own technology. Oh, I've got the iPhone 6, should upgrade to the iPhone 7, but Apple's brought out the iPhone 8 and they're just about to launch the 10, so I'll wait. Or I need a new iPad, but no, Google and Samsung will bring out something that's a you know, phone and tablet and a solicitor said glasses combined, so I'll wait. The pace of technology gets in the way of us making progress. And here's the third thing that's happened. The world is flat. The internet's broken down the barriers between people and companies and countries. And if you look at this map here, uh, Valerie Pierce pointed out there are more people living inside that circle than outside it. So if you think about seven plus billion people on the planet and three and a half billion plus live inside that circle, so China has 1.4 billion, India 1.3, Indonesia 250 million, Bangladesh 160 million, and further down the list, Sri Lanka, where I was born, 23 million. Same size as Tasmania, same population as all of Australia. Um, and you can see how the power shifted in the last 200 years. Because in the 19th century, it came from here, from the muzzle of a musket. In the 20th century, it came from here, driven by the dollar. And in the 21st century, it's coming from here. This is true people power, and this is what we face in our fast, flat, and free world. Um, and just look at those populations. I told you, the two biggest, China, 1.4 billion, India, 1.3. But look at this one, Facebook. Two billion users, 1.8 billion active users. We've got a website with more people than the biggest country on the planet. And then after that, LinkedIn, and only after that do we get another nation state. And with all these people comes power, economic power. So if you just think about it, for the last 50 years, most of the world's economy has been dominated by seven countries. Um, the USA and Canada uh, in Europe, the UK, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan. Okay, so we call these the G7. But PwC reckons that by 2030, which is not so far away, the power of the G7 economically will be matched by seven emerging economies, what they call the E7. So Brazil and Mexico, Turkey and Russia, uh, China, India, Indonesia. 2030, right? And then look ahead another 20 years when the power of the G7 has faded, we have another seven countries, which they call the frontier markets or the F7, which will also share that economic power. So Peru and Colombia, Nigeria and Morocco, the Philippines, Bangladesh and Vietnam. This is what our world is going to look like a generation from now. Okay, now, if you look at those G7, E7, F7 countries, um, there's one that doesn't appear on any one of those lists, right? So what does this mean for us here in Australia? Well, to answer that, let me ask you about another country. Um, if I said to you which country is famous for watches, chocolate, cheese and cuckoo clocks, what would you say? Switzerland, right? Yeah, okay. And there are a lot of benefits to living in Switzerland. Um, for example, for starters, their flag is a big plus. <laughs> I'm just going to say thank you to the few people who laughed at that, because uh, <laughs> when I road tested that joke on my 12-year-old niece, she said, if they laugh at that, they're just being kind. <laughs> so my point, and I do have one, is that some people are calling Australia the Switzerland of Asia. And it's not a bad analogy, right? Because if you think about anywhere in the world that you could choose to live, what sort of things would you look for? A country with a democratic government, still a reasonably strong economy and a good financial system and a strong currency, or at least a stable currency, and a few other things that make our little country in its own little continent girt by sea, but right on the doorstep of this Asian century, one of the best places in the world to live and work right now. 
if we take advantage of what this fast, flat and free world means. And the big thing for us, uh, for business owners and leaders, is to understand that it's not just about technology, it's about the fact there are more people now who say, I matter. Um, and I don't mean in an egocentric, you know, I'm the centre of the universe kind of way, because I'm sure you know people like that, I hope you're not people like that. Uh, but these are the people who are innovative and inspired, who don't wait to be told, who don't wait to be asked, who don't wait for permission. Um, these are the people who are going to be our future leaders. Uh, people like this. These are two young Australian girls who run Charlie's Crafty Kitchen. Anyone heard of them? Okay, so let me tell you about eight-year-old Charlie on the right, her five-year-old sister Ashley on the left. They're based here, but they have one of the world's most popular food and cooking YouTube channels. Millions of visitors every month. And it's all free because it's on YouTube. But because of all the traffic that they get, they've earned themselves a little bit of pocket money from Google advertising. Yeah, so this is true, and this is possible now. But the point is, it couldn't have been done 10 years ago. Because 10 years ago, um, TV still used to control visual access to the masses. Uh, but it doesn't anymore. So this is my little niece, my seven-year-old niece, Maggie, with her dad, my little brother. So she was, uh, uh, she's grown up as a digital native. Uh, she's, she only knows iView and online video. And uh, I was babysitting her recently, and I said, Mags, would you like to watch some TV? And she said, no, thanks because you can't choose, right? And you think it's not just TV, it's things like uh, newspapers, which used to control access to not just news, but things like real estate and jobs and entertainment, but it just doesn't anymore, because now we can control and influence where you might go for your next holiday, um, where you might go out to eat, even where you might get your next job. Okay, so this is what's happened. We have a fast, flat and free world and more and more people who say, who say, I matter. So let's do a little bit of crystal ball gazing and look at how we can become fit for the future. And uh, thank you, Kurt, for saying that I'm a futurist, which, which I am, and I put that on my, on my website, my business card. But I always feel like I need to establish my credentials. Uh, so people don't really know what a futurist does, so I think what I need to do to just establish my credentials here is predict the future myself. Um, and I'm going to do this with a little magic trick. So uh, it's a card trick, and I reckon some people here are going, what's a card trick got to do with my future? But I can tell you there are three really important lessons that you will learn from this card trick that are essential for us being, as that sign there says, fit for the future. Um, so I've made a prediction here, and uh, I'll ask you if you could please hold on to that. So there's something in there, but don't open it just yet. Just make sure I don't come anywhere near it. Um, I normally do this with a pack of cards, but I don't have one, so I'll just have to use my you know, invisible pack of cards here. So if I can say so, that I've got my invisible pack of cards and I've split them into reds and blacks. Would you take either the reds or the blacks? Yep, please take them. Yep, okay. Uh, if you can separate those, so you've got the black cards. Again, separate them into clubs in one hand, spades in the other hand, and just hold them up. And so would you point to either the clubs in that hand? Let's say clubs or spades. Would you point to them, sir? Yep. Spades? Yep, okay, take those. We don't need them anymore. Okay, so you've got the clubs here. So again, separate them. Actually put them on the table. And the picture cards in one pile, so the jack, the queen, and the king of clubs. And all the number cards in another pile. And so will you please take uh, the pictures or the numbers? I'll push them over there so you can reach them. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, which one did you take? The pictures or the numbers? Pictures, okay. So that's, a, that's the clubs, and you've got the picture cards, you've got the jack, the queen, and the king of clubs. Would you please take two of them, choose two of them, and give them to me? Actually, no, don't, don't give them to me, because I don't want to touch the cards. Uh, will you give them to the lady on your right? So you've got the jack, the queen, and the king of clubs. Okay, which two did he give you? The jack of clubs, the queen of clubs, and the king of clubs. So he's given you two. The Jack and the King? Okay, so you've got one last decision to make, and it's a really important one. So you've got the, which ones were they? Jack and the King? Okay, so you've got the Jack of Clubs and the King of Clubs. Would you give one to me? Just throw it to me. Which one did you give me? King. The King. Um, do you want to change your mind? No. You happy with that? Yeah. Okay. So ladies and gentlemen, by a process of elimination, there's just one card left here, right? And a number of people were involved in this decision, and it's the Jack of clubs, would you hold it up so everyone can see? Great, okay, and can you open the prediction I made earlier, please? And uh, just in case you can't see it at the back, it is the, the jack of clubs. Okay, so that's not bad, right? Okay, so now I'd, uh, have a, oh, thank you, thank you. <laughs> thank you. So, um, look, I know this is a smart group, so you've all figured out how it's done, so I won't bother explaining it to you, but what I'll tell you is that uh, 
What do you want me to explain to you? Yes. Okay. I'll tell you how it's done, but don't tell anybody else. Okay, so here's how it works, right? So first of all, um, it's always going to be the jack of clubs because that's the only card I've got, right? So it's always going to end up there. So the way it works is that whatever, go, whatever happens, whatever response I get, I interpret it the way that I want. So when I first say, do you want reds or blacks? So take reds or blacks. You took the blacks, great. We keep working with the blacks. If you'd taken the reds, I'd go, okay, I've got the blacks here. Let me separate them into clubs and spades. Point to that. If you point to clubs, we, I give them to you, keep working. If you point to spades, you take them and they get eliminated. Right at the end, you had the jack and the king. If you gave, you gave me the king, which is good because you get to be the hero and hold up the jack. If you give me the jack, I'd go, oh, great, this is the card that we ended up with. <laughs> okay, so don't tell anyone how it's done. But as I said, there are three really important lessons from this that are essential for all of us being fit for the future. So the first one is that I had to know the big picture. I had to know where we were going, um, whatever else was going on around me at a detailed level. So that's the first thing, um, having perspective. And the second thing is that whatever responses I was getting, I had to be able to get us to the outcome that, that I wanted. And the third one is that, you, you know, I could have done that with just one person, but it's a much better experience when you involve everybody. So in this world where everyone says, I matter, um, these are three things, the three key things that I reckon all of us should be doing. So number one, having that big picture perspective, because we are business owners and leaders. And the second thing is just understanding that our job is always about solving problems and getting to an outcome. Um, as much as it's all about the nitty-gritty details. And the third one is that it is still all about engaging with your people. So those are three things I want to talk about today. When Albert Einstein was teaching at Princeton University, he was criticised one year because he gave his students the same exam two years in a row. But he said, the questions are the same, but the answers are different. Now, I'm no Einstein, but I reckon the same thing's true now. Um, that some of the questions we're asking about how to get clients, keep clients, reward loyalty, uh, build our business, lower expenses, are the same as we've always asked, but some of the answers might be different. So let's have a look at some of those questions and answers. So let's start with this first one, which this first one is about big picture perspective. So I've got a bit of a puzzle for you here. And this puzzle's got cards, and they're a little bit different from the other cards. Uh, so let me just explain these instructions, and then I want you to tell me whether a statement I'm about to make is true or false. So you can see, stand up here, you can see, so these cards all have a picture on the front and a color, a solid color on the back. So you can see the back of number one and three, which is red and uh, yellow, and you can see the picture on the front of the, the other two. And I make this statement that every red-backed card has a dragon on the other side. And I'd like you to tell me whether that's true or false. Now, you don't have enough information yet to be able to tell me. You need to turn over some of the cards. Obviously, you could turn them all over, and then it'll be easy. You could tell me, but you don't need to turn them all over. So what I'd like to know is, what's the minimum number of cards? What cards must you turn over to be able to tell me whether this is true or false? So I'm going to play a little bit of funky music, and uh, I'll give you 30 seconds to talk to the people next to you. Which cards must you turn over to be able to tell me whether that's true or false? All right, let me tell you the answer. Okay, so you obviously need to turn over number one. Yep. Um, you don't need to turn over number three because it doesn't matter what's on the other side because it's it hasn't got a red back. Um, you, do need to, you also don't need to turn over number four because if it's got red, it actually doesn't give you extra information and if it doesn't, it becomes like number three, it's irrelevant. But you do need to turn over number two. Okay, so that's the answer, one and two. Did anyone get that? Okay. Yep, good, okay, so there's usually a few who get it. Okay, so here's what happens. Most people get number one, they don't get number two. Because there's no red, there's no back, and there's no dragon. And I reckon when we're looking into our future, there are two kinds of futures. So one is, like number one, where you can see it, um, and you may, not, you may not know exactly how to get there, but at least you can see it. And the second kind is a kind that you can't see. And that's where we have to be nimble and agile and flexible and ready to move into a future that we may not even be able to see. So we need a different kind of skills than, than what we've had in the past.
Now, the Institute for the Future has done some research that they've identified 10 key skills for the future workforce. These are things that can't be automated, can't be outsourced, help us be future-proof for ourselves, um, that our team members, and for our businesses. So I'm going to show you what those 10 are, but I reckon you probably can guess what some of them are. Um, so I'm going to give you 10, uh, 30 seconds to talk at your tables. What do you think some of the skills of the future might be? OK, what do you get? So just call them out like you've got Tourette's. What do you reckon? <laughs> what was that one? Coding. What's the sorry? Coding. Coding. Coding is why, yeah, there is one that's related to that. What else? Environmental. Environmental. What else? Adapting. 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 Yep. Okay. Uh, what's that one? Flexibility. Flexibility. Yeah. Okay, so let me show you what the Institute for the Future came up with. And I know I didn't give you a lot of time. Um, so I've grouped these into three areas. So the top three are about taking information in. The next four are about using that information, and the last three are about relating to other people. Um, so here's one. I'm sure everyone got this one, even if you didn't call it out. Uh, cognitive load management? Did... <laughs> yeah? Okay. Um, okay, let me try this one here. Transdisciplinarity? Okay. Okay, this is not going as well as I thought. Um, let me share what they are. Um, so things like coding comes under computational thinking. Things like adaptability, as someone said, novel and adaptive thinking. Um, things about the environment are more about being, um, uh, having diversity and uh, social intelligence. So some of them actually you would have got. So things like cognitive load management are about the fact it's information overload and getting stuff done with this huge amount of information that's coming our way. Um, new media, so we just heard from Felicity about some of the new media coming our way. So it's just making sure that we remain literate and have literacy in that area. Uh, creative, creativity and innovation is all about novel and adaptive thinking. Um, the deaf one that's up there. So the three that I want to look at in a little bit more depth is this one here called transdisciplinarity, which I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Um, this idea of having uh, design thinking, which is knowing, us, knowing where you want to get to and then figuring out the process to get there. And the other one is about diversity and social intelligence. So it's understanding the, the motivation behind, behind people's behavior. So let's look at this first one, which is transdisciplinarity. Uh, it's a big word, but it's a very simple concept. It just means looking at stuff that's outside your industry and applying it, uh, and your business, and applying it to yours. Um, so I think of it as just simply being a connector. So if, look at technology, trends, ideas, even if they don't seem to apply, how can you make them apply? Um, so I'm going to show you a little bit of a video here. It only goes for about a minute, and it shows you some of the things that might be coming up in our world by about 2030, and very few of them have an immediate and obvious connection to building. But I reckon you can probably find some connection somewhere. So let me just play that video, and then we'll talk about it.
but here's how you use the skill of transdisciplinarity. Um, and I'm just going to demonstrate it here with one example, um, not from this industry, but I'll take one from healthcare, so that you can then apply it with your, some of your creativity at your table. So I'll give you the chance to do that. But let me give you an example from healthcare. So I do quite a lot of work with uh, healthcare organisations, and when I speak at healthcare conferences, I paint this scenario for them. So in a few years' time, when somebody's having a heart attack, a self-driving ambulance will come along to pick them up. So it may still need a paramedic, but doesn't need a driver. Um, but that's not the big thing. It's just because all the cars on the road are self-driving and they're all wirelessly connected, they don't, the ambulance doesn't need a flashing light and a siren. Um, along the way, there'll be a chip implanted under the patient's skin that will send data to artificial intelligence software in the cloud that will do a diagnosis uh, of that heart condition and tell the cardiologist so she's ready when the patient arrives at a doorstep. Um, also, a 3D printer in the ambulance will print a stent for that particular patient for that particular operation. Uh, and a drone will deliver equipment and medical supplies so hospitals don't have to carry all that inventory. So all of this technology exists at the moment. It's not connected that way yet, but it exists. And then maybe all of that will become obsolete when we have this. Uh, nanotechnology robotic surgery. So the proof of concept was just demonstrated in Japan last year. So you're having a heart attack, you swallow a pill, and a tiny army of robots goes to work inside you doing the surgery. Um, what could possibly go wrong in that scenario? <laughs> Okay, so that's an example in healthcare. So you see how the exercise works? So I'm going to give you a minute talking at your tables about some of the technology that may, you know, even the stuff that Felicity talked about this morning, some of the stuff you've seen here, and things that you've seen elsewhere. How could that apply to the, obviously, the building industry, building and construction, but also to your own business? I'll give you a minute to do that now. Okay, so I hope you do that exercise, not just here but I hope you take it back and do it regularly with your teams as well, um, because that, that will help you uh, remain current and understand, even if things are a little bit further in the future, at least you have some idea of what's coming around the corner. And the second thing is this, that it's always been about getting to the outcome and solving people's problems. Um, so whatever you're doing day to day, always remember that eventually you're solving a client's problems. Um, this is the head of Google's global education. He goes around and speaks to school kids, and he says that when he does that, he never asks, what are you going to be when you grow up? What he says is, what problem are you going to solve? And I reckon that's a pretty good question for all of us in business to be asking as well. What problem are you going to solve when you grow up? Because... Uh, being successful in business and being fit for the future is always about solving problems. Your problems, your team problems, your customers' problems. And uh, you don't have to solve all their problems because you know, people have got lots and lots of problems. You don't have to solve them all. You just pick the ones that you're best equipped to solve. Um, for example, I've recently started working with a personal trainer. Um, so this is a before version that you see here. And you know the way the personal trainers advertise? So they always say things like, um, are you overweight? I can help you lose weight. You never see a personal trainer that goes, um, are you fat and ugly? Would you like to be just ugly? <laughs> okay. So you get to pick which problems you're going to solve and leave the others to somebody else, right? Now, it's just that the way you solve problems has changed now. So let me share with you two quotations from two of the greatest thinkers of the 20th century. Um, Albert Einstein said this, you might have seen it, imagination is more important than knowledge. Uh, and boxer Mike Tyson said this, everybody has a plan until they get punched in the face. <laughs> okay. And the thing is, there are so many things that are coming along and could be punching us in the face that some people think it's not worth doing any planning. Uh, now, that's not true. And I really love that this afternoon you're actually being, going to put, spend some time putting together an action plan for what you're going to do. Um, in fact, some researchers, Dr. Heidi Grant Halverson and her colleagues, have come up with, they've done some research into what works now. Um, how do you plan and how do you succeed in this fast, flat and free world? And so she's written this little book, so it's only a little book, called Nine Things Successful People Do Differently. And this is all about planning, goal setting and getting stuff done 
in a fast, flat, and free world. I'm not going to share all nine of them with you, but I'll share with a couple of them with you, um, a few of the ideas. So it's a, really, it's a small book. It's easy to just download and read it, but let me share with you uh, a few of the ideas from it. And the first one, the researchers did this with university students in the US. They were going home for their Christmas holiday, and the lecturer said to them, if you'd like to get extra credit for this course, then write an essay about what you did on your vacation and send it to me three days before Christmas. So they had to do it while they were on holiday. Um, and everyone was given that instruction, everyone was given that opportunity, but half the group was also told, think about when you're going to actually write that essay. And they just had to think about it. They didn't have to write it down, they didn't have to put it in their calendar, they didn't have to tell the lecturer, they just had to think about it. And what they found was those people were more than twice as likely to hand in the essay. So Dr. Grant Halverson calls this seizing the moment. And what they find is that the people who make time and schedule their goals in their calendar are more likely to achieve them. Now you might go, well, duh. But I reckon if you look at your calendar, you'll see it's full of phone calls, appointments and meetings. Most people's calendars are full of other people's goals. Okay, so give yourself the same respect as you give other people in your calendar. Um, and you don't even have to put in your calendar as long as you've got a system that reminds you to work on your goals. So the other thing the researchers recommend is this thing called if-then thinking. And it simply says if something happens in your life that is going to happen anyway, attach your goal to it. So if, if, here are a few examples. So you might say... If it's a weekly staff meeting, we're going to start by spending five minutes on, you know, I made up this thing here, innovation insights. So getting a team to talk about innovation. Uh, it could be something like this, personal. When I wake up, I'm going to go to the gym. So get out of the way in the day. Um, when I get back from lunch, I'm going to spend 30 minutes working on the big goal. Um, if I go shopping, I'm going to start with the fruit and veg. So you're attaching your goal, really important things, to other things that are less important but are going to happen anyway. So that's the first idea. The second idea is about what happens when things get hard. So the researchers looked at um, school students in the US, and what they noticed in the US was many uh, school students, the Asian kids, did better in exams than the local kids. And, you know, that's sometimes true here as well. Not always, but sometimes true. So they wanted to know why that would be the case. So they asked, the, in the US, they asked American parents and the Asian parents, when your kids fail at an exam, why did they fail? The American parents, these were their top four responses. Um, they're not smart enough, they had bad teachers, they were unlucky, or they didn't try hard enough. When they asked the Asian parents, why did your kids fail at an exam, these were their top four responses. Um, they didn't try hard enough, they didn't try hard enough, they didn't try hard enough, they didn't try hard enough. And coming from an Asian background, I know that was true for us as well. So we were always told, just try harder and you'll get the results. Um, so the researchers call this grit. You might call it persistence or determination. It just means pushing through when the times get tough. Another thing that goes along with grit is this other thing that they found, which is very, very important. And this research, again, was done uh, in, a, in a psychology experiment. And what they did was they had a group of people going in to, to solve some puzzles. And the puzzles were difficult. Some of them were impossible to solve. But they weren't actually testing how good they were at solving puzzles. They were testing something else. So what they did was they had half the group went into a room and before solving the puzzles, they had to fill out this big, long, boring survey like age and uh, demographic information. And while they were filling it out, on the table, there was a bowl of chocolates. And they were told, oh, please don't touch that. That's for something else later on in the day. Uh, also on the table, there was a bowl of radishes. And they were told, oh, if you feel a bit peckish, help yourself to radish. Okay, so that was the first group. The second group, they also went in there to fill out the long, boring survey. They had a bowl of chocolates on the table, no radishes, and they were told, oh, if you feel like it, help yourself to chockey. And then everybody went in, and they had to solve these puzzles. Uh, and as I said, some of the puzzles were uh, impossible to solve. And what they were testing was, who would give up first? And they found that the people who had to resist the temptation in that first room gave up faster. So it's like they used up all their willpower 
in the first room, and they didn't have any uh, when they had to do the important thing. So the researchers found that willpower is like a muscle. It wears itself out. Uh, uh, and you know this if, you've had a, if you're on a diet and you go on a late-night binge to the fridge, it's because you've worn out your willpower during the day. Um, and so they recommend this. Only, to, only focus on one big goal at a time. And I reckon that's what you should do. Set every 90 days, set one big goal that you work on. Okay, I want to share with you one more thing from that book, and that's about, um, again, what happens when you're working towards your goals. And this is based on that medical idea of post-mortems. So you know how post-mortem works? The patient dies, the surgeon and the team get together to figure out how they can prevent it in the future. And two Harvard researchers decided that they were going to try and take that idea and apply it to business. And what they did was they invented this thing called the pre-mortem. So the way the pre-mortem works um, is you look at something that you're working towards and, again, look at what happens uh, in the future. But you do the exact opposite of what most goal setting tells you to do. So most goal setting says, imagine yourself 12 months from now, you've succeeded, think how much your business has grown, your life has changed, your family is much happier and so on. The pre-mortem says, imagine 12 months from now, you failed. It didn't work. And then ask people around you, especially your team, to explain what went wrong. And people can come up with whatever they think might go wrong so that goal doesn't get achieved. And then, because all you're doing is imagining it, then you can figure out how to overcome those obstacles. So I reckon when you leave this conference and you go back to your workplaces, to your offices, sit down with your team and look at your two or three biggest goals from this conference and uh, figure out, uh, do a pre-mortem on them figure out what might get in the way of us achieving that three months or 12 months down the track. And then you know, take advantage of their smarts in actually making sure that that doesn't happen. So what the researchers call this, they call this being a realistic optimist. So definitely set stretch goals that are a little bit out of your reach, but be realistic as well so that you can, um, uh, you can anticipate and overcome the obstacles that come your way. So, as I said, um, that's a book from um, Dr. Heidi Grant Halverson, Nine Things Successful People Do Differently. It's a really easy read. I've shared four of the ideas uh, here with you. I reckon you should look at the others as well. Here's a third big area. The third big area is about involving um, everybody especially the people within your teams. Because we tend to think that um, as business owners and leaders, especially if you're in business for a long time, we think we know everything. But we do live now in the age of access, where people have more ability to influence than ever before. Um, let me tell you about when we first came to Australia. So this is a little picture, a picture of us uh, a long time ago. Uh, so that's myself, my two little sisters and my little brother, three years after we came to Australia. So we got accepted for immigration. We, we arrived in Australia in 1976. We got accepted for immigration in 1975. And, uh, and the reason we didn't come straight away was, as you can imagine, there's a whole bunch of bureaucracy and paperwork and uh, interviews and stuff to go through. So in that time, my mum bought us this little book about Australia and she made us read it every day. So we learnt about Captain Cook and Burke and Wills and Ayers Rock, as it was called at the time. Because my mum said to us, when we get to the immigration interview, they're going to ask you lots of questions about Australia. And if you get any of them wrong, they won't let us in. Now, I don't know whether she really believed that or whether she just wanted us to learn a little bit more about the country where we're going to spend the rest of our lives. As it turned out, it didn't matter because we went to the Australian Embassy, lined up with everybody else. The guy in front of us was asked who was the first Prime Minister of Australia, and he said, I don't know. And the immigration guy goes, congratulations, mate. Welcome to Australia. <laughs> So the reason I'm sharing that with you is because one of the things I remember reading about in that little book was about this the Royal Flying Doctor Service uh, and the School of the Air. And as an eight-year-old kid, I was amazed. Here were these other eight-year-old kids in this other country, and they didn't have a school anywhere near them, but they were still able to get an education. So now we call that e-learning or virtual learning, online learning, but we invented it here 100 years ago. Um, we still have the School of the Air, but we also have these massive open online courses, MOOCs. Um, has anyone done a MOOC? Can I just ask, attended one? Okay, so just a couple of people, right? Um, I reckon you should. 
because you could be in a, a class with 100,000 other students, but you get individual attention as well. And, but don't start with the big ones. Go with this one here, opentostudy.com, which is backed by a number of Australian and New Zealand universities. Um, it's really high-quality education for the public, and it's available free to anybody with an internet connection. Um, the reason I'm sharing this with you is uh, for two reasons. So one is I really want you to try it out, and maybe you'll find some stuff that's worthwhile, um, allowing your teams to do these courses as well. But the second thing is that this is done by professionals. So these courses are created by university lecturers and tutors. But it's not only professionals who can create high-quality stuff anymore. So that expertise, which we used to take as part of our business, and that's what clients pay us for, is now stuff that can be done by less professional, by less professional people as well. Um, here's one who actually does work in the education sector, but it's not part of his job. Eddie Wu is a year 12 maths teacher here in Sydney, and uh, he, one of his students uh, broke her leg, and she had to be in hospital for a while, and he didn't want her to miss out on her maths study in year 12. So he just set up a webcam at the back of his classroom, just started recording his, uh, his classes. And he set up this website, WooTube, and it's, uh, it's become a worldwide phenomenon because all he's doing is making what he's already doing and making it available to the world. So I did something like this on a much smaller scale. Um, this is my partner, Nikki, and her 18-year-old daughter, Abby. Um, so it's actually quite a nice photo of Abs. We don't have that many because, you know, she's a teenage girl, so she doesn't like being photographed in the wild. Uh, so... <laughs> At the moment, she's doing first year uni in Perth. But for the last two years, she was doing year 11 and 12. And one of the courses that she was doing was this one, ATAR Maths Methods. And uh, I don't know if anyone's actually had somebody recently gone through that. It's pretty advanced stuff, right? Like binomial probability distributions, differential calculus. And I did that. I, when I studied at, uh, in Perth 30 years ago uh, in high school, that's what I studied as well. So when I'm at home, I was able to help Abby. But because I travel a lot, that wasn't always possible. So I created a little website where all I did was work through a whole bunch of differential equations, solving them and speaking through how I'm solving them, and I published it online. And I did it for Abby and her friends, but I've left it there because why not? It's free, and it allows other people to get access to that. So this is what's happened. It's not just the professionals who are now making their expertise available. It's passionate amateurs who are just doing it because it's somebody that they care about. And, and this is what's happening in our I society. Individuals have more power than ever before. Um, let me show you this graph here. Um, by the way, I have a maths degree from the University of Western Australia, and that means that by law, I have to show at least one graph in every presentation. <laughs> All right, so um, this is what our population looked like a generation ago. Okay, so lots of babies and young people, not very many older people. And um, the last time we did a census, well, one that worked, it kind of looked like this. So more people at different ages, and the ABS predicts that by 2050, it'll be even more so. Okay, that has two important consequences. So I reckon one of them is pretty obvious. It's that, um, you know, we have an aging population. But the second one, which is not so obvious, is that for the first time, we've got four or five generations of people working together in the same workplace. And I reckon that's really interesting. It creates some really interesting and exciting opportunities, but also some interesting challenges as well. And as anyone who's ever you know, like tried to communicate across different generations, there's, there are some interesting challenges. And of course, in, in, you know, in any business, communication is important. Now, I can't solve all the communication problems of the world, but what I figured I'd do in the next five minutes or so is I will solve the intergenerational communication problems of the world is pretty good, right? You weren't expecting that this afternoon. So, uh, first of all, can I see the Gen Ys in the room again? 40 and younger? Oh, actually, okay, so good. Um, this is for everybody else. This is how Gen Ys communicate. And I'm going to show you using Facebook. So, for example, if you share something on Facebook and you get this response, TMI, it's, it means you've overshared. It's too much information. This one here, ROTFL, if you get that response, it means they're rolling on the floor laughing. Okay, now the, the more common one, of course, is LOL, which of course means laughing out loud. But you've got to be careful with this, because my mum told me that when she was growing up, LOL meant lots of love. So you don't want to get those mixed up. You don't want to go, so sorry to hear that a cat died, LOL, because <laughs> that means something quite different. 
Um, one more here. Um, I think some people have come across this one before. This, of course, means uh, welcome to Facebook. Um, <laughs> well, that's what I had to tell my mum anyway. So for you Gen Ys, don't look so smug because we had smartphones before you were born. <laughs> so that's for the Gen. So that tells you how Gen Ys communicate. Uh, I do need to return the favour and explain how other generations communicate as well. Um, I'm not a Gen Y myself, but um, I figure there's a language that all generations understand. It's the language of music. So I've written a song. Um, this song works much better when it's accompanied by a piano which um, I do happen to have here. Isn't it great that Qantas allows you to take pianos in hand luggage with you now? Uh, can you just amp the bass please a bit, David? Actually, no, don't do that. Um, I have no idea what that means. <laughs> I've just always wanted to say it. All right, let's see if I can get the right key here. La, 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 la. Um, they mentioned that I can't sing. All right, let's see if I can get somewhere near the right key. La, 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 la. Ooh. Actually, that is all I know how to play. <clears throat> um, so this is for the Gen Ys in the room. If you're not a Gen Y, you have my permission to sing it to any Gen Ys any time you come across them. Um, I call it how old people think. Uh, and old, of course, is anybody who's older than I am, which is 25. <clears throat> So, how old people think. A newspaper's like a blog, but with yesterday's news. And TV's like YouTube that you can't choose. A watch is like an iPhone that can only tell the time. But we all had to have one, even a mime. Yeah, sorry about that. When I was young, Cigarettes were filtered and water was not And cool meant cold and hot meant, well, hot And when I used the word random, it meant The result of a non-deterministic stochastic experiment It wasn't used, just randomly And now you've got your own language as well with WTF and TMI and OMG and LOL And just when I think I know what you're trying to say You hit me with another TLA That's a three-letter acronym. Thank you. Thank you, I do have CDs on sale at the back. All the money raised goes to a really good cause, singing lessons. So look, we can be light-hearted about this, but communication really is important. Um, does anyone recognize this? What is it? Pong. Pong, right? Pong. So this is what computer games looked like when I was growing up. Um, this is Nikki's teenage son, Josh. He's the one on the left. And uh, he, he loves computer games. And this is what computer games look like now on his Xbox. And the thing is, there are a lot of business leaders and business owners who are still Pong thinkers in an Xbox world. The good news is, we don't need to learn everything because we've already got those Xbox thinkers in our team, in our business. Uh, as one of my consulting clients, Dr. Nikki Howe says, uh, didn't you employ knowledge workers for their knowledge? So are you taking advantage of it? The challenge is, some of them might be the trickiest people to work with. Uh, so another futurist, Chris Brogan, a couple of years ago wrote this book, um, The Freaks Shall Inherit the Earth. And uh, if you can't read the subtitle, it says Entrepreneurship for Weirdos, Misfits, and World Dominators. So I'm not going to ask you to put up your hand, but I reckon if I did, there'd be many people here who would proudly say they're a freak because there's nothing to be ashamed of anymore. So these are people like Rajiv. He's not this billionaire business owner who decided to take on the Australian retail sector. He's just a bloke with three mates and a modem who saw a chance to do something different. And there are just so many examples in history of people who didn't see the talent and the freaks in front of them. And for example, this, you ought to go back to driving a truck, was said by a talent scout to Elvis Presley. And what about this one? We don't like their sound, guitar music on the way out. Who was it said about? Beatles. Yeah, the Beatles, right? Yeah. Um, what about this one? Can't act, can't sing, can dance a little? 
Uh, it's actually Fred Astaire. Uh, the last time I showed this, somebody said uh, Shane Warne. And it doesn't matter what he does, he will never amount to anything, was said by somebody who taught Albert Einstein. Okay, so how do you avoid making these mistakes with your business, with your team? Uh, let me tell you about my very first job out of uni. So I was working for a small software company in Perth, and I remember at one time having this business card, Gihan Pereira, head programmer, which I kind of like, and I still like to use, because I like to think that I'm still programming people's heads. But, uh, you know, at the time... I was in charge of the software development team. My mate, Pete Robinson, was in charge of the quality assurance and testing team. So even though we were mates, it didn't always feel like that because this is how software development used to work in the 1990s. So we would work for months on this software. We'd uh, do the feasibility study, then the functional spec, and then the design, the implementation, the testing, testing, testing. We get it perfect and then we hand it over to Peter's team for the final testing. And they'd always send it back to us with a big list of problems. So what they called bugs. So we used to play this game called, it's not a bug, it's a feature. Right? So whatever they sent back to us, we try and figure out some way that we could justify that that's how the software was supposed to work. So if they said, oh, the software crashes every hour, we'd go, oh yeah, that's not a bug, that's a feature. That's good ergonomics because then people can stand up and walk around while the computer is rebooting itself, right? <laughs> so we didn't always win that game. But it did teach me something really interesting. And I think it applies not just to software, but to people as well. And you could see some of the people in your team, and you might say they've got bugs. And if you see them uh, right next to you, don't go, that's you. <laughs> All right? But could you say, he's not arrogant, he's confident, she's not pushy. She's determined. He's not lazy. He conserves energy. <laughs> uh, she's not blunt. She's refreshingly honest. Uh, I'll give you one more. He's not irrationally psychotic. He's lovably quirky. <laughs> so, are you finding and nurturing and rewarding those people in your organization? Because they're the people who are going to help you become fit for the future. And they are either your current leaders, and if not, your future leaders. So we talked about those three things. We talked about you having the big picture perspective. We talked about you always focusing on solving problems. And we looked at engaging your people more deeply. Um, I want to, like we talked about quite a number of things here, so what I'd like you to do is talk at your tables. Maybe you've got some questions that have come up. Maybe there's some questions that people at your table can answer, or maybe they're questions that I can answer for you. So I'll give you a minute talking at your tables, and then uh, if anyone wants to ask a question, um, put up your hand and you can ask me. So I'll give you a minute to do that first. All right, let's have a look. Questions, comments, insights, anything that you'd really like to share from what you've heard, what you've seen, maybe some thoughts that you've had. Just stick up your hand and please ask or please share, share your experiences. Okay, so some people, one of the, big, one of the most common questions I get asked is what do I do next? And uh, actually you're going to do that straight after or, or towards the end of the day is actually set your action plan in place. But I reckon one of the things that goes wrong with most action plans is that when you get back into work, life takes over again. So I reckon when you create your actions at the end of today, make sure you've got some actions that have got some simple, quick wins in them. So simple things that you can do to build, it, build some momentum. Because people set two big goals and they set two long goals. So set the shorter goals, make them big, but set shorter goals and make sure you identify your very next step. Um, what else? Anything that anyone wants to ask or share? Okay, good. Uh, just before I finish up, I just want to share with you a couple of other things. So one is that um, I've arranged with Kurt and Kelly to um, give you access to my book, The Future of Leadership, and there's an online course that goes along with that. So it'll help you. It's designed especially for business people and business, uh, business leaders and business owners to help you put some ideas into place for the way that leadership is changing in the future. So you'll get that in the next week or so, um, both the book downloadable and the online course that goes along with that so you can implement the ideas from the book. Um, I want to show you a couple of things, share a couple of things to finish with. Um, the first is that I know the sort of ideas that I've shared, I've shared with thousands of people, and I know that in any group, maybe one in three will take the ideas away and put them into action. So look at the person on your left, the person on your right. If they look like unmotivated slobs, you're in luck. 
And the last thing I want to say is that uh, as much as we talk about technology and trends and even your teams leading you into the future, this is the most important thing. Um, I want you to be the person who says, I matter, who is innovative and inspired and can inspire. So I want to finish with a bit of music. I won't play this one on the piano. Uh, I have five questions for you about this music. Number one, does anyone recognize it? What is it? Packle Bell's Canon. It is, uh, yeah, it is, it is a Canon and gig in D major for three violins and bass, but for today I'll accept Packle Bell's <laughs> Canon. Thank you. <laughs> uh, question two, you've kind of answered already, which is who composed it? It was Johann Packle Bell, a German composer. Uh, question three is a little bit harder. When was it written? So I did some research into this, which means I just looked up on Wikipedia, and uh, I found that it was written about 300 years ago. Question four, what else did Packle Bell write? See, I think it's really interesting. When I did my research, I found that he was prolific. He wrote a lot of music. And I guess if you know a lot about classical music, you probably know some of the other stuff that he wrote. But for most of us, this is all we know. So, I had this German bloke. He lived 300 years ago. He wrote a lot of music, and most of it's forgotten. But every day, he touches the hearts and lives and souls of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of people. So here's my question five for you. How will the world remember you 300 years from now? Because I reckon if you really embrace this idea that I matter, decide where will you matter? Is it just at work? Is it home? Is it for the wider community? For whom will you matter? Is it your team members, your clients, your family, the world? And for how long will you matter? Today? Tomorrow? The rest of your life? Maybe 300 years from now. I matter, you matter, and we matter. The time to matter starts now. Thank you. <laughs>